and lost three full days, usually a few weeks before the G8's annual meeting. A fleet of black limousines drives the guests to a luxury hotel or palace of choice. Security is tight and includes members of the attending countries, secret services. Their guests include bankers, top businessmen and media moguls, as well as European and American politicians and leaders. When looking at the meetings, we can get some idea of how the nations of the future will be. Economic power groups owning both the world's capital and the means for production in an overpopulated planet, sick with poverty and short on natural resources. Past and present participants of the Bilderberg Group include the CEOs of France Telecom, Coca-Cola, Danone, Heineken, J.P. Morgan Chase, high-ranking British, American and European officials and cabinet members, and the editors of newspapers such as El País, La Repubblica, Le Figaro, The New York Times, Die Zeit and The Wall Street Journal, among others. What should we think when meetings like these have among their participants the owners of media giants and still their secret agenda goes unreported? Where does their loyalty lie? With their audience or with this secret society of the rich and powerful? The most popular Bilderberg conspiracy theory states that the group is a test lab for policies and decisions that countries and powerful corporations will later implement. According to this theory, the guests exchange their views on the proposals made by the most powerful countries. Thus, it is possible to predict how these countries will react in real life and fine-tune the ensuing courses of action. In defense of the group, their most recent organizer, Vice Count Etienne d'Avignon, has been clear. I don't think that we are a global ruling class because I don't think a global ruling class exists, he said. I simply think that it's people who have influence, interested in speaking to other people who have influence. And he added, when people say, this is a secret government of the world, I say that if we were a secret government of the world, we should be bloody ashamed of ourselves. The Bilderberg agenda, according to its own press releases, is the world agenda. Whether its members can then carry it out or not is open to discussion. The items on the Bilderberg agenda vary very little from meeting to meeting. A state of the world analysis, discussions on security in the West, debates on economic and political trends in the developed countries, as well as discussions on nuclear energy and lately biotechnology. Other famous guests at the group's meetings have included Giovanni Agnelli, then president of Italy's Fiat auto giant, and Henry Kissinger. Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, and Angela Merkel attended before assuming public office, as did Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General of the UN. Annan was married to Raoul Wallenberg's niece. Wallenberg, as we stated before, is the patriarch of the powerful Swedish family that has supported the group from its very beginning. Other participants have included Henry Ford II, George Pompidou, Helmut Schmidt, and Baron Edmund de Rothschild, together with the father of the American atomic bomb, J. Robert Oppenheimer. More names follow. Donald Rumsfeld, Alan Greenspan, George Soros, David Rockefeller, Queen Beatrice of the Netherlands, and US Senator and former presidential candidate, John Kerry. The list, while incomplete, represents the greatest amount of economic and political power ever concentrated in one single organization. Curiously enough, there are no disloyal Bilderbergs. Nobody has broken the silence, and if they do speak out, they do so many years after attending the meetings of the group, by which time it is already too late to change events. For many, these brief statements are proof that the suspicions about the group are staggeringly true. Years after participating in a Bilderberg meeting, George McGee, former United States ambassador to Germany, said that the Treaty of Rome that created the European common market was born 
in the Bilderberg meetings. Jack Scheinkman, chairman of Amalgamated Bank and also a Bilderberg member, said in 1996, the idea of a common European currency was discussed a great many years before it came about. We also discussed the possibility of the United States re-establishing diplomatic relations with China before President Nixon actually did it. One naturally wants to dismiss conspiracy theories, but it was David Rockefeller himself, a member of Skull and Bones, CFR and the Bilderberg Group, who said something that will be remembered as one of the most brutal confessions ever made. Something must replace governments. And it seems to me that private power is the adequate entity to do it. Whether or not secret societies control the world is open to discussion. What is clearly undeniable is that the most powerful people in the world are indeed accustomed to belonging to one secret society or another. Currently there are three societies that seem to have a monopoly on influencing global policy from behind the scenes. Skull and Bones, the Council of Foreign Relations and the Bilderberg Group. According to their critics, they're not different organizations, but the three heads of the same monster that is dead set on dominating the world through control of labor, capital, and land. But there is a fourth organization that conspiracy theorists keep bringing up. In contrast to the other three, its activities are public and nothing happens behind closed doors. However, that does not seem to stop the accusations against it. It's known as the Trilateral Commission. In 1973, David Rockefeller, also a member of the CFR, requested that his fellow Bilderberg members include Japanese representatives in the group. But the idea was turned down. He then created the Trilateral Commission, which compromises annual private meetings of some 350 people. Again, top businessmen and corporation executives, media moguls, politicians, and non-governmental organizations. But this time, including the Japanese. The idea was to create a trial law involving Asia, America, and Europe. US President Jimmy Carter was present at several of its meetings. But the trilateral is not only criticized by sensationalist authors, one of the most striking accusations came from Barry Goldwater, former Democratic American senator and presidential candidate, who described it in words that would make even the most paranoid person blush. What the trilateral is really up to is the creation of a world economic power, exceeding the political government of the nations involved. As managers and creators of the system, they will govern the world. In the 1980s, it was not the left wing, but the right wing that lashed out at them. The American Legion, the veterans of foreign wars, and the ultra-conservative John Birch Society denounced the Trilateral Commission and wanted Congress to investigate it. But their demands died, buried in red tape. During the 1980 presidential campaign, Ronald Reagan attacked Jimmy Carter by saying that there were 19 trilateralists, including Carter himself, in the administration. Reagan pledged that if he were elected president, he would not stop until he had exposed all of the secrets of the Trilateral Commission. But when Reagan finally became president, he included in his government 28 members of the CFR, 10 Bilderbergers, and at least 10 trilateralists. His vice president was none other than trilateralist George H. Bush. At this point, we must face one of the greatest mysteries surrounding secret societies, because the same names appear time and time again. Conservative and liberal, Democrats and Republicans, Nazi sympathizers and social Democrats all seem to live under the same roof in the pursuit of a common goal. 
Although they seem to have radically opposing views, in reality, they obviously share some of the same interests. The only possible explanation for this is that an establishment actually exists within the establishment. Perhaps that is what President George H. Bush was talking about when after the Gulf War in 1991, he spoke of a new world order. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. There are just too many coincidences to ignore, too many signs that suggest something is terribly wrong. After all, if we ourselves had that much power, money and access to classified information, who could say we would not also use it for our own benefit? If we follow the course of history since the Industrial Revolution, we will see a fascinating sequence of events unfolding that seem to prove the conspiracy theory, or at least provide major arguments for them. First, the ever-increasing concentration of cash and other resources in a few private hands, such as banks and gigantic multinational corporations. Corporations whose revenues are equivalent to the GDPs of entire countries and whose mere survival demands more and more profits year after year no matter the social cost. Second, the creation of public multilateral control organizations that are actually nothing but the public arm of powerful private interests. These organizations include the American Federal Reserve, the World Bank, and the IMF. Third, the undeniable advance of the process known as privatization. That is, taking non-renewable natural resources, communication infrastructures, heavy industries, as well as defense, health and banking systems, out of the hands of the people and delivering them into the clutches of profit-hungry private corporations. Fourth, the phenomenon of cultural and financial globalization that in truth amounts to little more than imposition of a dominant cultural and economic system upon those of peripheral countries. Fifth, the creation of worldwide conflicts and stereotypical enemies to manipulate public opinion and destroy any possibility of discussion or dissent, leading to the actual loss of many of the most elementary democratic rights. The US Patriot Act of 2001 is a good example of this. When panic attacks, people tend to accept more and more control. Finally, and most interesting of all, that almost all of the key players of these events, those who are really taking the decisions and hold the true political and economic reins of the West by being in command of its capital, armed forces, or even votes, are coincidentally grouped in just a few societies that meet behind closed doors. Are Skull and Bones, the CFR, the Bilderberg Group and the Trilateral Commission the cause or the consequence? Does membership mean enjoying certain privileges or is it that only those who enjoy certain privileges can become members? Does it really matter? Just look around and draw your own conclusions. Perhaps it's time to understand that nothing is a coincidence, that events are all interrelated and are always serving a higher power, that though hard to see, is in plain view to us all, if only we know where to look. Otherwise, while believing we are masters of our own destiny, we will be merely puppets in a play controlled by the sinister hands of secret societies. Guaranteed hot in 30 minutes or it's free. This is Mary. May I take your order? Hi, uh, Mary. 